Chavarim Kovim Shalanu Shalom Alecha. I want to thank our beloved Father God for the unbelievable mercy that He showed us, the Jewish people, over all the ages. You know, it, like He always said in the prophets, He says, I am with you to save you. And now He, he has brought us to this time, to this occasion where we have a nation back and we're together as a people and we're prospering. And um, we, I just have to thank him and for the goodness that he gives to all of us. You know, the event had a strange name. Some people wondered about it. You know, Palestine, the Jewish homeland. Well, as Jews, we feel it necessary to give a formal response to the continuous and relentless international initiatives which began in earnest in 1993 to create an Arab autonomous region and now an Arab state on the land that is most sacred to the Jewish identity. This is in Judea and Samaria, also known internationally as the West Bank. The Jews have only one nation and despite there being 22 Arab nations, strong activities are still going forth until this day for the nation's support of an Arab state called Palestine in the middle of Israel. It must be noted that the Jews are the only living indigenous people of this land formerly called Palestine. 3,300 years ago, the Jewish people crossed the Jordan River under the command of Joshua and possessed the land God had promised them. Since then, no other independent race of people have lived on this land as an independent nation. Only the Jewish people have lived here as an independent nation. When we were in forced exile, the land was being occupied by foreign powers. In exile, we continuously prayed to our God to return us to our land called Israel and our capital city, Jerusalem, established by King David 2,885 years ago. We have never relinquished sovereignty of this land to any other people. Even in the Jewish scriptures, which have been embraced by much of the world, there it testifies of the ancient historic connection of the Jewish people in this land, which was called Israel before the Romans changed its name to Palestine. Therefore, today, we put the world on notice that there never will be an Arab state called Palestine on the land that we call Judea and Samaria, <laughs> also known in Hebrew as Yehuda and Shamron. This land is the birthplace of the Jewish people. For this land was given to the Jewish people in a covenant by God, who is the creator of the universe. It was here our beloved God first spoke to our father Abraham, saying, To your descendants will I give this land. And that was 3,752 years ago. Since God is faithful, this promise will never be revoked. Therefore, the Jewish nation will never give up this land. This land of Judea and Samaria is crowned by Holy Jerusalem. It's written in the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 3. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of Hashem, and all the nations shall gather to it in the name of Hashem, or the name of the Lord. The world must know that Holy Jerusalem has been entrusted to the Jewish people. It's written in the Helam, the Psalms. Hashem is the builder of Jerusalem. He will gather the outcasts of Israel. Today, new blossoming Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria reveal the miraculous rebirth of our ancient Hebrew Jewish civilization on the land where we first began. Many of the ancient communities that had disappeared from Jewish history are now being rebuilt at the same location as their ancient counterparts. But the world did not recognize this miracle of rebirth because these communities were condemned from their inception as illegal, as an obstacle to peace, etc. However, they are the fulfillment of the words of our beloved God when he spoke to Jeremiah the prophet and said, I will return the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel, and I will rebuild them again as at first. The settlement movement called Gush Emunim started in the spring of 1974, and their first Jewish settlement community was born in the spring of 1975, exactly 40 years ago. And 40 years is a milestone of significant achievement, and I think we can all understand that. The building up of these Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria should be a project of the Jews of the whole world. It is so important that Jews settle all of their land. It's a Torah command for our people. You shall settle the land and possess it. 
Actually, the world depends on it. Redemption and shalom cannot come to the world until peace first comes to Israel. For God created Israel to save the world. Therefore, Jews must occupy all of their land. God loves all the nations and tribes and cultures and ethnic groups of the world, for sure. So if we truly care for them and want good for them, then the Jewish people need first to reach their full potential in their land. God said in the prophets, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. Not only is there Jewish prayer offered to the nations in Jerusalem, but nations and tribes can come to Jerusalem to see God, just as it says in Zechariah the prophet. And many peoples and powerful nations shall come to seek Shem in Jerusalem and to pray before him. And to, and to repeat what we just heard, at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Hashem, and all the nations shall gather to it in the name of Hashem. Everyone must know that the redemption of the world starts in Jerusalem. The prophet Amos speaks, On that day I will raise up the fallen sukkah of David, or the house of King David. This is what they're referring to. And I will repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and build it up as in days of old. And I will return the captivity of my people, Israel, and they shall rebuild the desolate cities and inhabit them. They shall plant their vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall plant gardens and eat their fruit. And I will plant them on their land, and they shall no longer be uprooted from upon the land that I have given them, says the Shem, your God. That's such a, a beautiful Hussek. When the nation of Israel reaches its pinnacle, the nations and peoples of the world can come to Jerusalem and pray to God who is near. And then healing and peace and restoration can come to the nations of the world. And the knowledge of God will cover the world as the waters cover the sea. Righteousness and peace will have kissed each other and neither will they ever learn and make war anymore. Uh, thank you, beloved friends, for coming out. Uh, we love you so much for coming. And thank you. We hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. So we have a very special guest coming up now. Um, he's an amazing person. His name is Solomon Ben Zimra. He's the co-founder of the organization called Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, and he's the author of an outstanding book called The Jewish People's Rights to the Land of Israel. Solomon, the microphone is yours. which is the, the, the book of Numbers in the Torah. In chapter 34 of uh, Numbers, the precise delineation of the borders of Israel with the same accuracy that as any uh, resolution of the United Nations, which is uh, it's amazing, really. And so the cornerstone is in the biblical narrative, and we are finding months after months after months gradual confirmations of this narrative in archaeological deeds in Israel. And, uh, and not only the Jews believe in, in, in this narrative, but the conservative Christians have always believed in it. And uh, one of these uh, special conservative Christians in the 1800s was uh, Eugene Blackstone, who was uh, instrumental in launching modern Zionism. Having said that, we cannot deny that uh, there is often some friction between the religious and the non-religious. And this is not only true for the Jews, it's only true for everybody. 
The, the religious Jews, they have subdivided into different uh, congregations, from the Baltimore Orthodox to the Reconstructionists. And on top of that, you have the Sephardi and the Ashkenaz, and you have the people from the left and the right, the liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats. So it's, it's a real a mosaic of, uh, of, uh, of um, a cacophony, sometimes. And so we have to find, we have to find something that unites us. Because this is the thing, at the point, uh, now particularly, when we, are, uh, when we are coming through a dangerous period, not only for Israel, but for the Middle East, for the region, and for the world, we have to find something that unites us absolutely with the basis on the ancestral religious narrative, but we have to uh, uh, find some rallying cry that uh, unites everybody from every faction. And this rallying cry, I think, is the, uh, the, the concept of the Jewish people. I, I, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it, it's not uh, obvious to talk about the, the, the Jewish people because when you, when you think of uh, Islam and the Muslims, for instance, or the Christian, there is no uh, Christian people, there is not the Muslim people. And, uh, and, uh, and the Palestinians, in their, in their uh, shrewd uh, evaluation, they found exactly the, the, that spot and in their uh, in their constitution, in their chapter, they said the Jews are not entitled to any land because they are just a religion. And so, imagine that. And so we have to overcome this nonsense and say we are a people. With all our diversities, we are a people and we should insist on the peoplehood which already embeds the original biblical narrative because all great civilizations were born from a religious uh, origin. What did we take the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, and now the Western civilization? All these civilizations came out originally with a religious belief. And this religious belief was adapted and uh, enriched and propagated up to the point where the, the culture was born actively. And when the culture flourished, and uh, gave its fruit to other uh, neighboring uh, cultures, you become a civilization. And no one can, can deny the tremendous uh, uh, impact that the Jewish civilization has had on the world. So, this is the idea, is to rally again, uh, uh, along the concept of the Jewish people. And this is exactly what the Zionists did. Theodor Herzl, in 1897, took this notion of Jewish people and he said, we have to have a land of our own. When he was in Paris and he observed the, the atrocities of, uh, of uh, the judicial system at the Dreyfus trial, he realized that uh, we have to have a country of our own. And so he insisted on Jewish people. And uh, in 1918, uh, in 1917, Balfour, Lord Balfour of Britain, took this idea and he said, yes, we recognize that the Jewish people are entitled to have a home and uh, a national home in Palestine. And so, and so that was uh, just uh, some kind of uh, uh, an expression of British uh, foreign policy. But it was very well received by the whole world when he, when, uh, when he made that, uh, uh, that same. A year later, or a few months later, President Wilson in the United States came up with an outstanding notion of self-determination of peoples. That means that anybody who is a people, any group who is a people, and by people I mean somebody who has a common culture, a common tradition, a long history, even a language, and the sense of kinship, they are entitled to self-determine themselves. And this concept of self-determination, introduced by President Wilson in, uh, in his 14 points in 1918, opened the door for the conference in Paris after World War I, where the Zionist delegation came in and they presented their claims. And their claims was that 
in accordance to the, the, the biblical narrative, we should reconstitute the same plan that we had from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, and the, uh, some part of the East Bank, and it, they drew a, a map, and it was very well received by the international community. A year later, the Supreme Council of the Allied Powers, who was the ultimate authority in, in determining what, who is going to get what after World War I, they met in San Remo, Italy, and in San Remo, they, they, they came up with a, with a, a momentous decision, which is to say that the Jewish people will have the sovereign right to the land that they used to have before, and that land will be put in trust, and Great Britain will be the trustee, and the Jewish people will be the beneficiary of that trust. And all this concept was included a year, two years later, in the Mandate for Palestine, in which you have, if you read one sentence only of the Mandate for Palestine in the third preamble, you will see this. Uh, thereby, a recognition is given to the historical connection of the Jewish people in Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting, reconstituting their national home in that country. Imagine the, the words that were chosen there. Let me repeat first. Recognition is thereby given to the historical connection of the Jewish people to, to, to the land called Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that land. And so here we have the center core is the Jewish people, they recognize the historical connection, and the historical connection can only be connected, uh, this history can only be connected to the biblical narrative that Ezra uh, uh, explained before. So we have the historical connection which establishes the link between the religious and the secular uh, facets of uh, the Jewish people, whether you are religious or you are secular, we have united in sharing a, a, a historical connection to the land. And then he said, and, and to the grounds of reconstituting their national home. By saying reconstituting and not creating, it means that the, the Supreme Council of the Allied Powers recognized that we have pre-existing rights. Because if you are reconstituting, is that you had something before that you want to bring about again. And so, what, are, what is it that we have before? We have before the nation of Israel, which has been sovereign for several centuries, starting with King David and ending up in the Hasmonean dynasty. So it's about for a thousand years, we had several periods of sovereignty, and this is what they wanted to reconstitute, reconstitute their national home. And by coming into national home, it obviously implied that sooner or later it will become a state, because of the national. You cannot have a, a, a national home without becoming a state. And so this is the importance of that sentence, which is embodied in the Mandate of Palestine, which is the result of the San Remo Resolution, and which is, and it, it, it only took about five years, really, from the, the end of World War I, uh, to the establishment of all these documents. So, what happened since? When the mandate was issued, uh, the Britain was the trustee, the beneficiary were the Jewish people, but unfortunately Britain betrayed the trust that, was, that they were obligated to follow. That is another long story, I won't get into that. But in 1948, Ben Gurion was at the, uh, in, uh, in Tel Aviv on that uh, Friday night, uh, the 14th of May, and he issued the Declaration of Independence. So here is Ben Gurion. In the few weeks preceding this Declaration of Independence, there were still some friction between the religious and the non-religious. The religious people wanted to have God mentioned prominently. 
the secular people say, we don't want to have anything to do with God. And Ben-Gurion had to fight with those two factions in order to bring about some cohesion and some unity. And they found it eventually by writing the Declaration of Independence, which is essentially a secular document. But in this secular document, where you insist about the, the Jewish people, the, the, the value of having the land, the democratic principles that the Jewish people are, are aspiring to, but also at the same time, he mentioned the Bible as the book of books, he mentioned the prophets of Israel, and he mentioned that the whole authority derives from Sur Israel. And so Israel, so in Hebrew means the rock. So Israel is one of the many names that is given to God. And that is the concession of uh, concession. That is the, the, the way you went in order to satisfy the religious people without uh, creating, uh, grabbing too many feathers from the same. So this is what the Declaration of Independence is, also centered on the Jewish people. And just after the next Israeli elections on March 17, you are going to see a bill that is going to be tabled at the Knesset, and I hope it will pass, as constitutional law of Israel, saying that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. That is exactly the word. They didn't want to say Israel is a Jewish state because, like the Palestinians, some people who say, oh, Jewish state, it is a theocracy. It is like an Islamic state of Iran or Saudi Arabia. He said, no, it is the nation state of the Jewish people. And that's the beauty of it, to center it into the Jewish people, which encompass at the same time the secular aspect and the religious aspect, because it is the longer outcome of 3,500 years of history. And as I said before, every civilization originated in the religious beliefs. And so this is where we are now. And I hope that uh, this past the 100 years, really, were the most momentous uh, in, in terms of uh, the Israeli and the Jewish history. You know, in, in spite of all the vicissitudes and the ups and downs and the Holocaust and so on, we did in these 100 years far more than, uh, than anything that was done in the past 2000. And so I hope that everybody will find some, uh, uh, will adhere to this rallying cry of the Jewish people, which is central to have unity, and by having unity without, uh, without uh, uh, calling for uniformity, you can have unity with diversity, but unity is the sine qua non of strength and progress. Thank you.
including Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. Okay. 1939 LaRousse Dictionary is the flag for the Jewish homeland. In slide number three, the stamp with Rachel's tomb, one sees the Aleph Yud standing for Eretz Yisrael, land of Israel, with the name Palestine. Thus, Palestine, Eretz Yisrael. My husband has this stamp from his childhood, and he, along with others in this room, like Hannah, is a Palestinian. In slide four, the 1936 Palestine Symphony is the Jewish Symphony. In slide five, the 1948 Palestine Post is the Jewish newspaper. The American Christian Palestine Committee chairman recorded, quote, the Arab population of Palestine was small and limited until Jewish resettlement restored the barren lands and drew to it Arabs from neighboring countries, unquote. James Parks, in the History of Palestine from 135 AD to Modern Times, published in 1949, stated, quote, when organized Jewish colonization began in 1882, there were fewer than 150,000 Arabs in the land. That's from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. The great majority of the Arab population in recent decades, remember he's writing in 1949, recent decades, were comparative newcomers. The 1930 British Commission Hope Simpson report criticized the British government for allowing the large-scale Arab immigration. Quote, this illegal immigration was not only going on from the Sinai, but also from Transjordan and Syria. The Syrian governor recorded that in a few months, in 1933, some 30,000 Syrians moved into Palestine. President Roosevelt observed that between 1921 and 39, Arab immigration, quote, has vastly exceeded the total Jewish immigration during the whole period. In slide number six, we see Joseph's tomb in 1894. And then in slide number seven, Joseph's tomb in the middle of the ancient Jewish town of Shechem, now called Nablus, the Arab town. The world powers allowed the British to betray their legal charge to facilitate the return of the Jewish people to their homeland. Instead, the British blocked the Jews up to, during, and after the Holocaust while allowing the entry of a huge number of Arabs. The UN inherited the functions of the League of Nations. Its charter guarantees rights derived from mandates never expire, Article 80. Nevertheless, the General Assembly illegally recommended the partition plan, chopping off half of what had been left to the Jews of the land west of the Jordan River. Because the Arabs refused the partition plan, it gained no legal status. The countries which now vote for an Arab state in Judea and Samaria, referred to as the West Bank, already have confirmed in international law that this land from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean was the Jewish state, as has United States in the Lodge Fish Resolution and the British American Treaty. In addition to Article 5 of the Palestine Mandate prohibiting the ceding of land to any foreign powers, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties confirms that all acquired rights derived from mandates never expire. After the 1948 declaration of the modern Jewish state, the Arabs attacked and illegally occupied Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. But all parties agreed that the ceasefire lines would not constitute borders. During these years, 800,000 persecuted Jews fled from Arab countries where they had lived even as long as thousands of years, while fewer Arabs left Palestine, Eretz Israel, largely at the behest of their Arab leaders to prepare for the planned massacre of the Jews. In the 1967 defensive war, Israel liberated Judea and Samaria, <coughs> the eastern part of Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, and captured the Sinai Peninsula. In slide number nine, and the unjust Jewish occupation of Arab land, we see the one tiny Jewish country in the world among a huge land mass of only some 
of the Arab countries. In 1977, Zahir <coughs> Hussein, a PLO leader, said, quote, the Palestinian people does not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means for continuing our struggle against the state of Israel. In slide number 10, we see the European Union illegal funding of illegal building in Judea and Samaria. In slide number 11, we see the late Howard Grief with his masterpiece on Israel's legal rights. Along with the great Christian lawyer, Dr. Jacques Gauthier, Howard Grief has opened our eyes to the significance of the San Remo Resolution and Israel's legal rights. We thank Minister Baird, the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Committee, and Prime Minister Harper's government for their moral courage. We ask the Canadian government to acknowledge the We ask the Canadian government to acknowledge the legal commitment it made as outlined in the petition by Howard Reed for the reaffirmation of Jewish legal rights to the land of Israel and former mandated Palestine, previously assented to by Canada in 1922. I ask you all to please consider signing the petition on the table, asking Defence Minister Kenny to help save the Yazidi people and the other minorities from radical Islamic terrorism in the Middle East. In previous generations, massacres were enacted against the Jews under the false blood libel, claiming that we kidnapped, murdered, and drank the blood of Christian children. During the Holocaust, the Mufti of Jerusalem and the Nazis made a deal to prevent the Jews from reaching Israel in order to break once and for all the bond between the Jews and Palestine. The Mufti's disciples have unleashed a blood land libel against the Jewish people now, falsely claiming that there is an Arab people who have national rights to a state in Palestine, and that the Jews have stolen their land and persecute their people. The PA and Hamas are open about their goal to annihilate all of Israel. This genocidal false accusation of illegal Israeli occupation debilitates our children who hear all around them that we have become the oppressors. This lust for Jewish blood, fantasized rewards of homicide suicide, celebration of kidnapping and murder of Jewish teenagers, firebombing of toddlers. We know that young Adele just passed away. Hundreds of attacks inside Israel monthly. Today, a man was saved because the mayor of Jerusalem just happened to be passing by when an Arab stuck a knife into a Jewish man. And he had his bodyguard with him, the, Arab, the, the mayor. 20,000 rockets sent to civilian sites. This coveting of a sliver of land belonging to the remnant of a persecuted Jewish people. This lying and perverting molding of their children into psychopaths in order to steal the Jewish homeland and massacre its people is driven by radical Islam. It is the same radical Islam which burns to death, beheads, rapes, massacres, enslaves in the Middle East and targets all the free world, especially and including our Yazidi friends and their community. We all need to come together to fight for our survival and our common goals of human rights and dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Renana. Uh, a lot of good information there. Uh, I've learned, I learned some good stuff there. Um, our last speaker is not here, but you will see her up on the screen. Uh, Rafaela Segal is the assistant mayor of Kedemim, and she produced a special video uh, just for this event, and uh, to have a message uh, because this year is the 40th anniversary of the establishment of Kedemim. Um, and uh, so, you know, she, Rafaela, is, you could probably consider her one of the true heroes of the Jewish people because. You know, not only is she the assistant mayor of Kedemim, a professional optometrist, she travels the world on behalf of Kedemim, raising money for the institutions there, and acts as an ambassador for Judea and Samaria. She's a mother of nine children, and
and a grandmother of 38. And she still looks like very young. And uh, so we're going to play this uh, short video of her and, uh, and then um, we'll probably have a break. Shalom to all our brothers and sisters, Zionists and lovers of Eretz Israel. I'm standing here in Gdumim in the Shomron. Gdumim, the first community that by the dedication of its founders opened the way to the return of Jews to Judah in Shomron. I'm married to, to be one of the founders of this community and now we are entering the 40th anniversary of our life here. I want to share with you a memory from 1967, Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the Day of Independence. There were two personalities from different backgrounds that had a spirit of prophecy. It was a custom in Merkaz Arav, a yeshiva, where Harav Kuk was the head of the yeshiva, to celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ut with joy and dancing, and usually he used to give a talk about the miracle of having the State of Israel. This year, there was an exception. It was different. Arav Cook spoke about the miracle, about the joy, but he started to cry. Where is our Hebron? Where is our Shechem? Where is our Bethlehem? Something is missing. The same period, Nomi Shemer, a poet, wrote the known song, Yerushalayim of Zahav, Yerushalayim of Gold. Also, putting the emphasis of what is missing in Jerusalem and some sentences mentioning that no people are going anymore through Yama Melach to Jericho. Two weeks later, there was the Six Day War with the great miracle of us, Israel, defeating the nations and coming back to these areas, Yudah and Shomron. We left our comfortable homes and moved to Yudah and Shomron with difficult conditions. Against all odds and the skepticism of many people in Israel, we managed to create a revolution. Despite physical conditions, no running water, no electricity, we brought Jewish life back into the Shomron. From Gdumim, we can see the hills of Grizim and Ebal, the tomb of Joseph between it, Shechem. Next to Ariel, there is the tomb of Yoshua bin Nun. In Itamar, not far from here, the graves of Itamar and Elazar, and all these places where our forefathers were walking. From Hebron to Afula, there is a route that we use today Gavahar, the Route 60, which actually is paved on the ancient uh, route Derech Avot. Today, when the world is trying to force a Palestinian state on us, they are basing their claims on the, the denial of our rights on this land. Today, it became clear that the Palestinians don't want to sign an agreement with Israel. They want to establish a state without an agreement. And they're going from state to state, universities, the UN, to prove that we are actually not legitimate. By this, they will create a pressure to uproot the communities. So here we become partners. You that love Eretz Israel, you that believe about our rights to this land, and know that without the heartland of Israel, the areas of Judah and Shomron, there's no meaning to the rest of Israel and no fate for the, for the future to Israel. You are doing your share by your activism, by going from place to place, by articles, by convincing different personalities about our rights and showing how wrong are those that spread the rumors about the connection of the Palestinians to this land. You show the biblical connection, the historical connection. I want to thank you all for your love to Eretz Israel, for understanding, for spreading the word 
about the importance of Yudai and Shomron and what you are doing. Chazak chazak ba'adameinu u'badarei loheinu. How are you? Rabbi Gary Zweig, we're about to see the famous film The Awakening of Judea and Samaria. It's Oscar night and you're going to agree with me that this is one of the award-winning documentaries about Israel. I'm very happy you're here and I really hope you enjoy the film. Thank you. What is going on in the hills today is Rabbi Tzvi Yudakuk. It is written, and they will yet again plant vines in the mountains of Samaria and drink their wine. Hi, my name is Tria, and welcome to the Hat Minimin Visitor Center, Sagot Winery. Just so you know, on this big map here, uh, all these blue dots you see uh, are the locations of Jewish communities um, in Judea and Samaria, and this is the land where our nation was uh, founded uh, under Joshua, and then afterwards the rest of the nation was settled. So. Today we want to say a special lachaim to the Jewish settlement movement of Gush Emunim, which means block of the faithful. Gush Emunim was brought forth in 1974 by spiritual leader Harab Svi Yehuda HaKohen Cook, son of Harab Abraham Yitzchak HaKohen Cook, the first chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Palestine in 1921. Gush Emunim, in your efforts to settle Judea and Samaria, Untold thousands and thousands of you became uh, joined, joined to you. In this inspired work, you gave birth to your first Jewish settlement community in the spring of 1975. In your 40 years struggle to settle our land for the sanctification of God's name and for the uh, present and future generations of our people, hundreds of you were murdered and hundreds and hundreds of you were wounded and thousands of you were driven into mourning and sadness for loved ones and friends who were murdered and wounded. You endured immense difficulties and conceived communities under harsh circumstances, often without electricity, water, proper sanitation facilities, enduring the harshest elements. Every day you had to worry if your loved ones would be murdered on the roads, and at night you worried, will your communities be infiltrated? The whole world spent 40 years trying to stop you, and lies and slanders were spoken about you every day. Large portions of your own people were either unaware of your work or unable to appreciate the monumental struggle you are undertaking. You had to witness the destruction of 21 Gaza communities and four other ones in Northern Shamaran, as well as see the horrific forcible extraction and humiliation before the world of your brothers and sisters who live in these communities. However, know for certain that the heavens and the earth bear witness that you never gave up. You never gave up. Your deeds will be remembered for all generations as ones who were laying foundation stones for the kingdom of our beloved God. So now, may you, O oh God, God of Israel, acknowledge this 40 years of dedication, hard work with mysterious nefesh and tears, and positively respond to your people Israel, and fulfill your word which you promised in a covenant to our father Abraham, and the words you spoke through the prophets, and multiply your people Israel like sheep on the mountains and the hills and the valleys of Judea and Samaria and all the land you gave to your people as a heritage. And may you make your name great among the nations in Jerusalem and rest your spirit upon your people and bring shalom to your Jewish nation and give them one heart in genuine love and unity and bring salvation and redemption to the whole world for the sake of your great name, and quickly usher in the days of shalom for all mankind. Amen. Well done. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone, for 